Okay, I think we are uh, live. So welcome everybody to, to this uh, session. Uh, so Luca, can you uh, put back the, or, or uh, Mauro, can you put back the, the flyer? Uh, if I can put back what, sorry? Okay, now that's fine. Uh, okay, so welcome to the uh, to this virtual edition of Automatic, uh, and uh, in particular to this session on uh, multi-agent systems two. Uh, so we will uh, start. Uh, uh, actually, we are perfectly on time. We will start uh, uh, with the first talk. Uh, the speaker is uh, uh, Luca Ballotta. Uh, and the title of his talk will be Computation, Communication, Trade-offs and Sensor Selection in Real-Time Estimation for Processing Networks. Uh, so please, Luca, start uh, whenever you are ready. Uh, yep. Share the presentation and then start, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Giuseppe. As uh, I just said, I will talk about Computation, Communication, Trade-offs. Um, and sensor selection for processing networks. And this is a joint work together with my supervisors, Luca Scanato and Luca Caglone. Our motivations are network control systems where agents communicate over wireless. And in particular, they have um, sensing and computation capabilities. And this is the case, for instance, of robots in target tracking scenarios or devices in smart grids and smart buildings, and so on. All of these systems are affected by latency, and in particular, we are going to consider two sources of latency. The first is caused by um, data being delivered over the wireless channel uh, between nodes. And this is uh, called the communication latency or communication delay. And it's caused by, mainly by communication constraints such as limited bandwidth or finite channel capacity and so on. And the second source of latency is caused by the devices uh, when they process um, locally information, for instance, mobile robots. And, um, and this latency is called computation latency and this caused by resource constraints such as limited hardware or battery. We're interested in latency in particular, uh, thinking about time critical control applications. These are applications where uh, the information needs to be delivered timely across the system. Uh, and for instance, in this example, we can see that if a car uh, doesn't receive sensory data in time, it may need to estimate its position in open loop, for instance, biodometry. And this, of course, uh, may lead to a very poor estimate over time that can be dangerous if, for instance, the car is driving in a urban environment. So in this contribution, um, we are uh, proposing a mathematical model of such policy networks where we consider a dynamical system and uh, in, in presence of computation and communication delays occurring in the network. And then we are focuses on the case study of sensing design for optimal estimation. Um, we first start from a simple case for which we derive an analytical solution. And then we look at the general case that it's tackled with a greedy selection algorithm. This is the general framework. As I said, we have a dynamical system uh, that is monitored by a set of sensors. Each sensor can um, possibly pre-process locally the information and then transmit the data over a shared wireless channel. Um, all the measurements are collected at the central station that is in charge of using all the all such measurements. And uh, all of these three stages come with some delay that we are I, I'm now going to describe in detail. Starting from the sensors, as I said, um, each sensor can acquire measurements and perform some local preprocessing that takes uh, some time, which we address as computational delay tau y. Uh, we assume that uh, the refined measurements, this Z, are affected by the computational latency. And in particular, um, in particular, each sensor can perform some kind of anytime algorithm 
which is described by this computation delay. And you may think, um, so in general, an anytime algorithm uh, is as the feature that the more time is given to the sensor for processing and the better the output is. And you may think this uh, either as a classical, uh, for instance, descent algorithm. Uh, for instance, um, in this case, the computational delay may be directly associated to the number of iteration of the algorithm. Or um, also the sensor may have a, a class, uh, a family, for instance, of available um, algorithm that it can implement. For instance, in this plot, we can see uh, several neural networks that can trade inference time, therefore complexity, uh, for the classification error. Um, so in general, we assume that the preprocessing inaccuracy uh, is decreasing with the computational delay tau y. And I will make this clearer in a few slides. Now uh, I address the computation communication trade-off. Uh, in classical sensor network, in classical wireless sensor networks, we have the sensors acquire measurements and transmit raw measurements, for instance, in this case, raw images over a wireless channel, um, paying the cost of uh, communication delay. If we consider instead the smart sensors, uh, these can pre-process locally the information, and therefore this uh, leads to a more compact, uh, in general, representation. If, for instance, the sensor is able to extract minimal, meaningful information from the measurements, and therefore in this case we can trade some communication delay for some computation delay, and therefore a trade-off emerges uh, where we can choose whether to process more or uh, allow um, for more communication delay. We assume that the channel is unreliable and there's some packet loss and both communication and fusion take some time, some delay. Um, both communication and fusion delays uh, are maybe either constant or decreasing with the preprocessing and this uh, second behavior addresses exactly this, uh, this computation communication trade-off, where we assume that uh, if I allow the sensor to process more, uh, there will be uh, fewer packets to transmit. And from this illustration, we see in general the impact of all the delays uh, to the fusion task. And we can see that in general, uh, if, uh, if time t is the current time instant, uh, the fusion um, that is performed at this time, so the fusion output that is available at time t, um, it's impacted um, by all the delays occurring in the system. And in particular, um, the fusion can only exploit outdated information. So collected up to this time instant, for example, and Basically, all this time span needs to be somehow recovered in open loop. We next uh, focus on the task of centralized state estimation. So the central, uh, the central station fuses the uh, data to compute an estimate of the current state. And uh, we focus on this problem. Uh, so we are given an LTI system with an available sensor set. And uh, we want to select a suitable sensor subset uh, together with the preprocessing delays for each selected sensor in order to minimize the expected error variance. Uh, where in particular we can see that the performance that is the uh, expected error covariance is affected by the um, preprocessing delays and in particular the estimate of the current state um, can, can only exploit outdated information. Notice that here, uh, this is not a, uh, let's say, a classical sensor selection uh, where uh, we minimize some cost of the sensors, but also uh, we are binding uh, the, um, the sensor selection to the selection of the preprocessing. So this, it's, a, it's a coupled selection. Uh, we kick off this problem by considering a simpler instance of a scalar continuous time LTI system with a homogeneous sensor set, meaning that all sensors are identical and with the same delays. And we consider uh, the optimization already with respect to the preprocessing delay, so with, with no sensor selection. 
Uh, this is the mathematical model of the state space system. And where we assume that the variance of the measurement noise is decreasing with the computational delay to address the latency, um, the latency accuracy trade-off, meaning that if I allow the sensor to process more, uh, it will be able to drop the measurement noise variance, and therefore obtaining more accurate um, output data to be transmitted. Therefore, um, if we focus, uh, if we look at the estimation of the outdated state, the outdated estimate, uh, this is uh, its error is decreasing with the measurement with the sorry um, with the preprocessing delay tau because we allow the process more, so we allow uh, it to get more accurate information and for a more accurate estimate. However, um, then we need to recover the um, open loop gap, and therefore the prediction error is increasing with the preprocessing delay. In general, we, um, we, as, uh, we assume that there is an optimal sense, an optimal sensor preprocessing amount tau star to be recovered in order to minimize the error variance. This is indeed true, and we show that um, both with stable and unstable system, considering all the preprocessing communication, uh, communication and fusion delays, there's a unique um, um, preprocessing amount that minimizes the error variance. So this corresponds, for instance, to a realization and instance of an in-time algorithm that is able to minimize the overall error variance for estimation. Um, furthermore, if we look at the, a, a network where we don't consider a fusion delay, you can see that um, we can increase arbitrarily the number of sensors without dropping performance because the estimation error is only decreasing with the number of sensors. However, when we consider that the central station needs to uh, spend some time to process the information uh, coming from each sensor. We also have that the prediction error is increasing with the number of sensors because um, we have more, um, the central station needs more time to process all the information. And therefore, this show that, shows that we also need to select a suitable sensor amount in order to minimize the um, estimation error. Uh, and in general, the optimal sensor amount is not equal to the maximal sensor amount. So this also motivates formally the sensor selection that we are addressing in the general problem. So the um, original formulation is an NP-hard problem because it's combinatorial, both with respect to the uh, sensors to be, to be selected and with respect to the preprocessing delays. And therefore, it's tackled with a greedy approach, a greedy selection algorithm. I'm not going into detail into the details of the algorithm here. However, the general idea is that is to uh, build the selected set by adding iteratively one sensor at a time in a greedy fashion. And for each candidate subset, we are optimizing the preprocessing delays by minimizing the, um, the cost function one delay with respect to one delay at a time. Numerical simulations show that our algorithm is actually able to recover a near optimal performance and both with respect to the uh, selected subset of sensors and of the of preprocessing delays. And in particular, it's interesting to notice that as we increase the, um, the size of the available sensor set, in this case, going from six available sensors to 96, um, it's uh, considering all the latency components that I have highlighted before, so uh, preprocessing, communication, and fusion becomes more and more, more and more important because neglecting uh, some of these components may lead to very poor performance. And here we, you can see very high costs uh, when we neglect some of these latency components. It's also interesting to notice that the near optimal sensor amounts that, is, that are selected by the greedy algorithm may be very different from the total uh, available sensor amount. For instance, where, when we have six and 12 sensors, uh, only two sensors are selected by the algorithm. And with 96 candidate sensors, only five are selected, corresponding to this green bar, uh, as opposed to the 
um, yellow and purple bar. So to conclude, uh, we have presented a mathematical model for such policy network where um, we have sensors that can both measure man the environment and perform local uh, computations, local processing of the acquired measurements. And then we uh, study the um, sensing design for the task of optimal estimation in such processing network. Um, for the simple case of a continuous time LTI system, scalar with scalar state, we show that a, an analytical solution is, um, can be recovered. While for the general setup, we uh, design a greedy selection algorithm, which shows uh, with heuristic simulation to have uh, near optimum performance. And if you're interested in this topic, I, um, I invite you to survey these two papers. The first uh, regards the analytical study while the second focuses on the uh, general setup. Future works or work directions include uh, improving the communication model and in particular uh, addressing unreliable communication and random communication delays. While um, a work about sensor scheduling as opposed to the sensor fusion is currently in preparation. Uh, secondly, it will be interesting to address general graph topologies, so distributed approaches, distributed um, systems uh, where sensors and agents interact with each other, and for instance, also addressing multi hop communication. Uh, this is all. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you so much, uh, Luca, for uh, for your very interesting talk and uh, for being perfectly on time. Actually, you. Thank you. <laughs> Ten minutes. Um, so I remind you that if you have questions, uh, you should please uh, ask them, uh, write them down in the in the chat, as uh, Mauro Francescelli was uh, suggesting. So uh, please go ahead. Actually, in the meantime, I can ask you a question, Luca, so that mm -hmm. uh, while we wait for sure. the others to write them in the chat. So I have actually a couple of questions. Uh, can, can you go back to the um, uh, histograms that you were showing? Yeah. Yeah, so I was wondering uh, why, uh, I, I'm not sure I understood, uh, for example, the, the very last one. So I was expecting, uh, um, uh, so the green and the okay. So the green is the true one, and the, the best one that you can make is the violet one, right? Uh, yeah. So I, I refer to this plot, right, on the right. Yeah, yeah, that one. Yeah. Yeah. So in so in um, in this in actually both experiments, uh, the only difference is that here uh, we are also able to compute the true optimal because it it's. A uh, few sensors here uh, instead becoming the true optimal becomes well, impossible. I was wondering why, with 24 sensors, you were doing better with the orange one rather than the, the last one. But probably it's just a matter of the greedy. Yeah, so for sure. Um, so uh, uh, so far, we um, we couldn't uh, we couldn't yet, yet come with the um, performance guarantees for the algorithm because it's a greedy selection uh, that it's more uh, of an heuristic, let's say, algorithm. So it's actually difficult to uh, understand precisely the behavior. Uh, for sure, we can see, for instance, that uh, the green bar here, which is the cost, uh, the, let's say, optimal cost decreases. And this is intuitive because we are adding sensors. So we are, uh, let's say, allowing the algorithm to choose from a, a bigger um, uh, basin of sensors. So there's more choice. And for instance, uh, yeah, here it's interesting that uh, with 24 sensors, um, oh, sorry, with 24 sensors, um, the optimal choice is to select three sensors, but also if we, um, so this yellow bar is if we neglect sensor fusion. Uh, yeah, if we neglect the fusion delays. Here, uh, also here the algorithm select, selects actually the same sensors. Um, but as you said, is probably a matter of how the um, the greedy selection is performed. Because for instance, in 
in all the other cases, you can see that the, the yellow bar is far higher, uh, in particular here. And, and in both in these two cases, actually all sensors are selected, uh, leading to a very high cost because of the fusion delay that leads to a very uh, high prediction error. And same happens more or less also with the other cases, with the other bars. Okay, I think uh, uh, we should move to the, the other talk, but uh, uh, if there is any, just one more question for Luca. I don't see anything in the chat. Okay, so uh, thank you so much uh, again, Luca, for, uh, for your talk. Thank you. So we move to the second talk which is uh, joint the title is joint communication schedule and control uh, design for perturbed the network control systems in presence oops, sorry of state and input constraints and uh, our speaker is masud brahini right yeah so please masud uh, you can start thank you uh, hi everyone, thank you for the introduction. My name is Masud and I'm a PhD student in Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. My supervisor is Paolo Falcone and I also work with Mario Zanon and Alessandro Colombo. In this talk, I'm going to present you some of the results that we have in uh, communication and control design for network control systems. Uh, Masud, we are not able to, to see your presentation, at least I'm not able to see. Oh. Okay, sorry. Maybe I need to share again. Can you see it now? Yeah, now I can see it. Okay. Thank you. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, so uh, here is the motivation for my research. Uh, this is actually a project from Volvo Cars in Sweden. They have some autonomous vehicles and they want to have different test scenarios to see whether the vehicle can uh, perform certain tasks in certain situations. In order to do that, uh, they have some soft targets that are uh, that can move, uh, and they want to put them in a specific uh, locations in specific times to see how the vehicle autonomous vehicle reacts. And these tests are expensive, so if there's a delay or something uh, that can jeopardize the test, then uh, they have to redo it, and in order to prevent that, they have a central system that uh, controls these soft targets such that uh, a, a specific scenario occurs for this uh, vehicle, and uh, the center communicates through uh, 5G, for instance, with these soft targets, and there are outside sensors, remote sensors like cameras, that can measure the position and the speed of the soft targets. So uh, we transform that problem into this black diagram. We have uh, some disjoint systems uh, that are perturbed. Uh, we have some remote sensors which can measure the states of the systems. And then we want to send these uh, states into the controller for each system through the communication channel. We assume that our communication channel has a limited bandwidth. So uh, we cannot uh, send all the state measurements at the same time, so we have to choose a few of them uh, to send at each time instant, and this is decided by a central scheduler, uh, which we call delta. Uh, here in this presentation, for simplicity, I just assume that I can just transmit one state measurement at a time, but we have uh, extended this work for multi-channels as well. So this can be... Uh, an example of an example for this setup could be autonomous vehicles and the measurement could be their positions. So uh, I repeat, we had a, we have a limited bandwidth, so only a few systems can communicate through this communication channel at a time. The scheduler uh, ha has to decide which state should be communicated uh, using delta. This scheduler could be either offline or online. In this presentation, I represent an offline version of it. Uh, and we have local controllers and the task for the controller is to preserve invariance. We assume that the systems are subject to state and input constraints and we want to preserve the invariance for the systems to guarantee constraint satisfaction. So to be more specific, uh, each system is described as follows. Uh, the systems are uh, LTI systems and they are perturbed. Uh, 
uh, we assume that the state input and the disturbance uh, are constrained into some uh, compact polytopes that include the origin. Uh, I want to emphasize that the disturbance is unknown and uh, it's, or it, it, it is inside this compact set, but we have to design the communication schedule and the controller such that these two constraints are satisfied. So these are the constraints that we want to satisfy in our design. The controller has access to the actual state if uh, the system is connected means that if label i appears in the schedule, uh, so the state prediction would be equal to the actual state. But if the system is disconnected, uh, then the controller doesn't have access to the actual state. It has access to the prediction state that is uh, calculated using the nominal dynamics and the previous uh, prediction. Uh, in this framework, we use control invariant sets. The control invariant set for this system is a set that is a subset of the feasible set for a state. And it has the following feature. For any point in this control invariant set, there exists an input that is inside the feasible input set. So there's an, a feasible input such that the next state belongs to the control invariant set regardless of the disturbance. And uh, there are many control invariances for a system and among them we use the maximal one, which is the largest control invariant set for the system. So I want to uh, point out that in this definition, if the controller has access to the actual state, uh, meaning that the communication is unlimited, then there always exists a controller such that it preserves the invariance. And if invariance is preserved, then constraints are satisfied automatically. But in our framework, the controller has only access to the state estimation, which could be different from the actual state. And in that case, there is no guarantee that the invariance is preserved. And if the invariance is not preserved, then the constraints could uh, be violated. So in our presentation, we suggest a framework that guarantees that. So let's formulate the problem. We want to, uh, we assume that we have a set of systems as described with initial conditions that are inside their maximal control invariant sets. And we want to design this delta, which is the schedule and control loss for, for the system such that the states remain in the invariant set for all future times, which in turn uh, guarantees uh, constraint satisfaction for all systems. So let's see uh, what happens when a system, uh, when, when a system is uh, evolving open loop. So let's assume that a system receives a measurement and after that it doesn't receive any measurement. So we want to check the disconnected dynamics. In that case, the next state is a function of the previous state. The controllers that are a function of the uh, last measured state, in fact, and the disturbance. So using this dynamics, we can define a positive integer safe time interval that is the maximum time that uh, the node can evolve open loop without any measurement and remain in the invariant set. And we can calculate this positive uh, variable using reachability analysis as follows. Uh, in order to present a visual uh, example for safe time interval, let's consider that we have a controller that is a linear controller uh, and it uses the state prediction. And let's assume that SI infinity is the invariant set for that system. So in this case, um, here my figure is showing the first state of the system, the second state of the system. Uh, the red uh, area is the invariant set. And I want to investigate how system evolves in open loop. So this is my initial condition for time zero. If I go one step, since my controller is stabilizing, the state is going toward the origin, but there is some uncertainty around the next state. So this is my actual state. Uh, this is my uh, nominal state, but the actual state could be anywhere from here to here. So if the system evolves, you see that the nominal state is going toward the origin, but the uncertainty around it is growing. So at time three, the uncertainty is even bigger. And at time four, you can see that some parts of the purple area is outside the invariant set. 
So it means that there are some disturbances that can drive the states at time four outside of the invariant set. So it could be either here or here. So in, in this case, our safe time interval is less than four. And if you calculate this for all the states in the invariant set, you, you find that alpha is three in this case. So let's have another example. So now we know that we can find safe time intervals for systems. Let's consider an example with four nodes and the following safe time intervals. So basically we are saying that the first system needs one communication each two time instance. The second system needs uh, one communication each four time instances and so on. So here I have presented a schedule that is periodic, cyclic, and I have, uh, uh, I have written the first period of the schedule. In this schedule, for instance, if you focus on system two, it needs one measurement in each four time instances. So if I pick any four ex ex consecutive elements in this schedule, I should see label two at least once. So you see in the first four, I see label two. In the second four, I see label two and so on. And if you have another cycle, you see that it is preserved. This, this feature is preserved for all the systems. So in my example, this schedule guarantees that each system receives the measurements at least once during each alpha consecutive time instances, which in turn can guarantee uh, invariance for each system. Th this is the definition of a famous uh, scheduling problem that is called pinwheel problem. And it's as follows. So given a set of uh, positive uh, integer variables, uh, we want to have uh, an infinite sequence of symbols of one to Q such that uh, at least one symbol I appears within any alpha I consecutive subsequence of this schedule. Uh, this pinwheel problem, uh, here I'm going to explain the features of a uh, pinwheel problem and say when there is a schedule for this problem. It can, we have um, static and uh, state feedback versions of this schedule in our previous publications, uh, which is CDC and ECC. Uh, but here I'm going to just explain the features of this scheduling. So we know that if a, uh, an instance of the pinwheel problem is, uh, admits a schedule, means if we have a problem that has a feasible schedule, then there is a guarantee that there is also a cyclic schedule for that problem as well. This is very important because we know that we can restrict our search to cyclic schedules. And we know that if there is a schedule for the problem, we can find it by looking for a cyclic schedule. Uh, it is also useful to define a density function for each system, which is uh, defined as summation of one over safe time intervals. In, in fact, um, for system I, uh, this, this system needs to receive one measurement in each alpha time instances. So it occupies one over alpha I of the bandwidth. So the summation of this shows the portion of the bandwidth that we need to allocate to these uh, systems. So, uh, intuitively, if density is uh, bigger than one, there's no schedule. So density less or equal than one is a necessary condition for schedulability. And if the density is less or equal than 0 0.75, this is a sufficient uh, condition for schedulability. There are algorithms uh, in that find a feasible schedule in polynomial time uh, for the system if the density for the problem, if the density is less than this value. So this is a sufficient condition. Uh, it, it is, uh, I, I want to also note that in the dense cases, meaning when uh, density is one, uh, deciding the problem is NP hard. It means that it's NP hard to decide whether the problem has a schedule or not. Uh, so here, uh, I want to go back to this definition. We see that uh, safe time, is, we see that the smaller the row is the better. Uh, and the safe time interval has an inverse relationship with it. So it is, uh, uh, it is benefited, uh, we can benefit from a bigger alpha because if alpha is bigger, then this value is a smaller, which guarantees that the density is a smaller and in turn, we can guarantee that there is a schedule for the system. So let's see how we can uh, uh, increase alpha for each system. Alpha I was the behavior of the system during uh, 
open loop uh, dynamics so it it is independent of the schedule and uh, the following algorithm uh, finds the maximum achievable alpha for system i uh, it, it actually uh, is a brute force uh, search algorithm so it, it uh, checks um, when there is a solution so let me explain this set. so uh, the algorithm starts with k equal to one and it is for uh, which points in the invariant set there are controller inputs such that the nominal uh, state is inside the invariant set minus uh, the summation of disturbances so if if that holds then we know that the nominal state plus any disturbance would be a subset of the invariant set and the invariance is preserved. If, if then this set is equal to the invariant set, meaning that this holds for all the points in the invariant set, then we can increase K and see whether we can uh, achieve this for a bigger alpha. And then when the algorithm stops, uh, we can report the last alpha that this was feasible. So here, uh, in the previous slide, we found the maximum alpha that is achievable for each system in the node, uh, in the network. And uh, here we want to design a controller such that the safe time interval for that controller would be this alpha. It, this, this will give you a controller that has any alpha smaller or equal than alpha I max. Uh, we, of course, choose alpha equal to alpha max uh, so that uh, safe time interval is maximized. Uh, this is um, a, a standard MPC formulation. We have a stage cost and a terminal cost. Uh, the initial state uh, by assumption is inside the invariant sets and the states are evolving based on the nominal dynamics uh, with feasible control inputs. And we want the terminal state to be inside the invariant set minus the uh, the set that is the summation of the disturbances. So if that's the case, then we know that the nominal state plus any disturbance would belong to the invariant set. And of course we choose Q, R and PF as positive definite matrices. So uh, let me provide an example uh, to see uh, how, how this works. So let's consider uh, five remotely controlled vehicles with uh, this, this dynamics. And these parameters, we assume that the systems have the same dynamics. So I chose the same parameters, but it could be uh, the systems could have different dynamics as well. This is just uh, a choice to make it simple. Uh, this is uh, our choice of uh, feasible set for the states and feasible sets for the controller. The only difference that uh, uh, we consider here is in the levels of the disturbance, we assume that the first system has bigger disturbance level than the second system and so on. Uh, so we expect that the safe time interval for this system would be smaller, meaning that this system needs more measurements because it has a higher level of disturbance. So if you compare the safe time intervals, in the first row I have the systems one to five. Uh, first, I assume that my feedback is designed based on a simple LQR. Uh, in that case, I have the safe time intervals. In the second case, I consider um, a linear feedback, but I try to optimize the feedback gain such that alpha is maximized and I get these results. And in the last case, uh, I have MPC, which is the uh, scheme that I just presented and I get these results. So it's interesting to calculate the density functions in these three cases and compare them. In the first case, the density is not defined or infinite. Uh, it means that for instance, for system one, uh, when safe time interval is zero, it means that uh, the system has no invariant sets. So uh, you cannot guarantee constraint satisfaction with this controller uh, so independently. Yeah, sorry, you have just one more minute. Uh... Yeah. Uh, and for the second system, row is bigger than one, so it's not feasible. And for the third case, row is smaller than one, so we can have a feasible schedule for the system to wrap up uh, I, to uh, to introduce my future works i want to have i want to consider couple dynamics i want to have output feedback not measure all the states and i also want to uh, validate this experiment yeah thank you for listening and
please let me know if you have any questions. Okay, so thank you very much for the nice talk and the interesting topic. Um, is there any question for uh, Mazut? And as usual, you should uh, type your question in the chat window. So while we wait for, for a question in the chat, let me ask you a question. So uh, from what I see, your approach is a deterministic one, a worst case scenario. So are you thinking about the possibility of a probabilistic one in which you allow some uh, probabilistic violation of the, uh, in the invariant set like this, like the scenario approach or similar approaches? Uh, yeah, you're right. Uh... My project is to consider uh, to design a, a schedule and control for critical systems. And in those systems, we have hard state and input constraints, which we don't want to violate. So I cannot consider a probabilistic framework for that problem, because if even there's a small chance that those constraints are violated, then we don't meet the safety condition that we want to guarantee. So I cannot uh, go toward that framework. Yeah, but uh, we have a probability of failure in, uh, in every every device in our life so if you make the probability very small then uh, yeah then we hope that it doesn't happen anyway yeah uh is there any other question okay so then thank you again for uh, for your presentation so we move to the to the next one so uh, the next talk uh, will be given by uh, Marco Mirabilio. So Marco, you're there, right? So the title of his talk, uh, and, and uh, actually uh, the, the title of the talk is on the utilization of macroscopic information for string stability of a vehicular platoon. And uh, I think you will introduce your quarters. So please, Marco. OK, thank you. And uh, hello to everyone. I'm Marco Mirabilio from the University of L'Aquila. And today, as I said before, I will uh, present our work entitled uh, On the Utilization of Macroscopic Information for String Stability of a Vehicular Platoon. It is part of a work that we will present at uh, the Control on Decision and uh, um, on the Conference on Decision and Control of the ECR. So, here. You can see the outline of uh, the presentation. After, to, uh, after a brief introduction to the problem, I will discuss about the dynamical model considered, then about the controller design uh, to end with some platoon stability analysis and simulations. OK, the traffic control problem is a well-known problem that is studied for years. And it is uh, mainly due to the high number of vehicles that are uh, on our roads. That poses uh, different issues from uh, psychophysical safety uh, to the pollution problem, but also to uh, economic drawbacks uh, due to traffic congestion for the industry that directly operates with uh, the transport area. So we need to, adop to adopt uh, various strategies, uh, such as uh, intelligent routes and autonomous vehicles to face the traffic control challenges. So uh, the Motivation at the basis of uh, our work is that we live in a world even more interconnected, thanks to the evolution of technology that offers the possibility to interconnect various agents on our roads, from the, uh, from the infrastructure to the vehicles. Then this interconnection allows gathering a huge amount of data, but we need to find a way to use the information con contained in this uh, uh, amount of data. So it's uh, our objective to show how to properly define macroscopic variables to improve the platoon stability, and then to exploit it on, uh, on in the local controller, uh, for example, applied through the use of cooperative adaptive cruise control by each vehicle. Uh, the, the end of this approach is to obtain a mesoscopic model that is a family of models that incorporate features from both the macroscopic and the microscopic models. Just to give a little review about these, uh, these models, uh, we can say that the macroscopic models consider the traffic as a flux and then describe it uh, with the macroscopic variables such as the density, the mean and the variance. 
uh, while the microscopic models focus uh, on uh, the dynamics of each, of each uh, single vehicles and, for example, car following models belong to this family. Okay, then, after this brief introduction to the problem that is a well-known problem, uh, we can see the framework, uh, the framework considered. So, as you can see from the picture, we consider a set of N plus one autonomous vehicles that proceed on a straight road where uh, vehicle zero is the leader vehicle and from one to upper N uh, is the set of follower vehicles. So we represent, we describe each vehicle uh, by the longitudinal position, speed and acceleration that is the control input, and we define the state vector uh, x as in equation one with the corresponding uh, dynamical system. In our work, we consider, we assume that information can be communicated either through uh, vehicle to vehicle technology or uh, vehicle to infrastructure technology or both. Then we consider, we assume that a communication channel exists no matter which. So, on the basis of the state vector defined before for each vehicle, we define the state of each color car following situation between a pair of uh, consecutive vehicles, uh, i and i minus one, as you can see in equation two. And uh, the state vector is denoted with the uh, variable key. So we can obtain also the corresponding dynamical system in equation three. And we assume that uh, there exists also a virtual leader indexed by minus one that proceeds with constant speed v bar. This assumption allows us to consider uh, equation, um, the dynamics in three, in equation three, um, to consider these dynamics also to describe the car following situation with respect to the leader vehicle zero, but also to define the equilibrium point key bar, uh, as uh, you can see in this part of the slide, where delta P bar is the desired intervehicular constant distance, and zero is the equilibrium point of the speed difference that uh, is uh, one of the components of the key vector. So, now that we have introduced the dynamical model, the framework that we have considered, we can speak about, uh, we can speak about the controller design. Before to present, but before to develop a controller for uh, the platoon, we have to adopt a spacing policy. In our case, we have considered the mesoscopic variable spacing policies as in equation four, where delta P bar is the desired constant in their regular distance at steady state. And uh, the term rho im is a function describing the macroscopic information um, with the goals to avoid collision between the vehicles both in transient and in steady state phases, but also to improve the transient phases by appropriately varying the intervegular distance. And this uh, intervegular distance is varied through the use of this uh, macroscopic function that embeds information about the whole platoon. Okay, then the macroscopic information that we consider in order to define uh, in the next slides this, uh, this macroscopic variable are the distance average invariance and the speed tracking error or uh, speed difference average invariance that we first embed in the functions P delta P and P uh, delta V. Then, we define the uh, state vector rho of the dynamical system with the corresponding dynamical system uh, represented here in equation five, where lambda one and lambda two are the values of the system and uh, the parameters A and B are uh, chosen such that we can weight the information, the macroscopic information deriving from the psi functions. Then, uh, defining rho em equal to the first component of the rho vector uh, through a backstepping method, we uh, have obtained the controller equation in six. That results, that results to be a mesoscopic controller because as you can see, it considers uh, both the microscopic information uh, that is the desired uh, intervegular distance or the current intervegular distance and the macroscopic information contained in the row function, but also in the psi functions. Okay, 
Then, after that we, we have the value and the controller, we can also analyze uh, the platoon stability in the sense of string stability. Uh, the string stability mainly uh, means that the oscillations that are arriving from the head vehicles must not amplify through the, st uh, through the string, but possibly to dissipate. So we define with key hat in equation seven, the extended vector uh, with respect to the closed loop system applying the control input presented before. And with key hat with key uh, high, the corresponding equilibrium point. So in equation eight, you can see the uh, corresponding dynamical system. And before uh, to, to show the main results of our work, we need to um, choose the string stability, some string stability definitions and uh, that are reported in, the, reported in the, this slide and introduced by Johansson and Bessling in the cited work uh, in the bottom side of the, of the slide. As you can see, these definitions are given in a Lyapun of stability uh, way. Okay, then here is the first result that we have obtained in our work. Um, the result is that we are able to ensure that the uh, state trajectory of each car following situation, here in, uh, denoted with key tilde, that is the difference uh, between the extended vector key hat and its uh, equilibrium point. So we are able to ensure that this uh, trajectory translated in the equilibrium point is uh, bounded uh, for each t. It means uh, that we can contain and uh, also dissipate the oscillations deriving from the hidden vehicles. And this inequality is at the basis of the successive theorem that states also the asymptotic string stability. Indeed, here you can see uh, the other main uh, result of our work uh, that states the uh, asymptotically string stability of the system of the platoon. This proof is based on the forward recursive application of inequality nine, then you can understand that this uh, inequality is very important in our work. And then also by exploiting the properties of mean and variance, but also uh, on the definition of composite diagonal functions. Uh, indeed, we use nonlinear tools to uh, prove the stability of the overall platoon. Uh, but for more information, you can refer to our work that uh, we will present on uh, in the conference of this year. Okay, then to test the, the, um, the proposed control strategy, we have simulated a platoon with 11 vehicles with perturbed initial conditions, that means non-zero initial variance, but also um, we have inserted a disturbance that acts uh, on the leader vehicle zero. So in this slide, uh, you can see the speed and acceleration profiles. Uh, on the left side, the, there, is, uh, there are the speed profiles of the platoon. And uh, uh, between seconds zero and 10, the platoon is able to uh, reach the, the stability, the steady state from the perturbed initial conditions while between seconds 10 and 20 uh, acts the disturbance, a pulse disturbance on the leader vehicle. But as you can see, uh, the vehicles are able to dissipate these oscillations and also uh, the last vehicle to anticipate its, uh, its action thanks to the information embedded in the macroscopic functions. And in the end, between seconds 30 and 60, uh, the platoon is able to track the variable speed, uh, reference speed given to the leader vehicle. On the right side, uh, you can also uh, see uh, the corresponding acceleration uh, profiles of the vehicles. So, and uh, in particular, uh, the last vehicle is uh, able to anticipate its action, uh, providing the disturbance attenuation during uh, between the seconds 10 and 20. Also, you are, uh, can see the distance profile of the platoon of the vehicles, and they are able to track the reference speed. Uh, and in uh, between seconds 10 to 20, they are, they are also able to dissipate 
uh, the oscillation deriving the disturbance. So, in conclusion, uh, our main results is the introduction of microscopic variable, uh, variables in a microscopic framework uh, obtaining a mesoscopic uh, dynamical model, uh, the string stability of the platoon, or asymptotic string stability of the platoon, and also we have seen an, an anticipating behavior of the tail vehicles uh, from the simulations. Future works uh, will comprise the analysis of more complex traffic scenarios, such as the mixed traffic case. That means a platoon to consider a platoon composed by both uh, autonomous and non-autonomous vehicles, but and uh, the extension to more complex vehicle models with non-idealities. For example, uh, considering uh, communication delays and uh, actuation delays. So this is all for now, and thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you so much, Marco, for the very nice talk. Um, again, if you have if you have questions, please. Uh, I see one uh, in the chat. Um, okay, uh, hi. I uh, I wanted to ask you. Um, I, I, I have seen that you consider um, intervehicle distance, which is a uh, constant. But uh, could you include in this approach uh, an intervehicle distance, which is a function uh, of the speed of a vehicle? Because usually, for safety reason, the distance will change with um, the desired speed. Uh, yeah, um, this, uh, but when we vary the distance, the reference distance with speed, we are, uh, we are um, considering a variable spacing policy with, uh, a, for example, a constant time headway. That is the approach that uh, commonly we as human beings uh, realize during the, uh, the grid. But in this case, our, uh, our intention is to uh, to increase the traffic throughput by uh, by letting the platoon to converge uh, uh, to the always to the same intervehicular distance, but to ensure the safety or string stability during transient phases, we uh, embed the microscopic we exploit the microscopic information embedded in the raw function. Then uh, we can say that uh, although is a variable spacing approach. Uh, um, is a mixed <laughs> approach because the end is a constant spacing approach that uh, as you can uh, as you can uh, we can find in literature um, this approach without um, the without uh, global information cannot ensure string stability of the platoon in indeed uh, when we if we consider a simple constant strategy, we need to share to the entire platoon, uh, for example, the speed reference of the leader or uh, its uh, velocity, acceleration, and so on. So okay. uh, this is our goal, our end. Okay. Okay, thank you. And I also have another small question. And what happens when uh, one vehicle uh, stops cooperating? With the others, so if if one of the vehicles just stop stops communicating, yeah, so what a, happens? Uh, yes, uh, this is a very nice question, but uh, we don't uh, we haven't uh, um, analyzed this case. Uh, although it's very interesting because it it is a stray, um, strictly linked uh, with uh, communication problems. Uh, <laughs> I mean, in simulation. I mean, what happens if ah. you if you simulate and the one vehicle stops? So, do they? Uh, what happens? In this case, uh, there is the disruption of the platoon because uh, we, after uh, this vehicle, uh, stop to receive microscopic info also microscopic information involving uh, the the other vehicles. So, I think that uh, it can be a problem for the safety for the safety of the entire platoon. Okay, thank you. Okay, so is there any other question for Marco? Okay, if not, uh, yeah, Luca Ballotta has a question. 
Uh, yeah. <clears throat> so if I understand correctly, uh, the, um, you are assuming that all uh, measurements, let's say, so um, positions and velocities are like perfect measurements. Um, yes. Okay, so uh, how would you regard um, the, um, the possibility of having noisy measurements, for instance, uh, position and velocities um, uh, with respect to your controller? Uh, I don't know if you have uh, started considering no noisy measurements or if, if you think the controller would be robust enough or not? Uh, yes, I understand your question, but uh, since uh, we were interested in proving the novelty of our approach, we, uh, we, we, were, we were forced to consider a nominal case, but um, this question arises uh, because uh, uh, in the reality we have, uh, as, you, as you said, noise and other communication problems. So uh, it will be, uh, I think it would be a nice and interesting extension to our work that now I, I, I don't know how to, how to answer because uh, it poses uh, other challenges. Yeah, yeah, okay, okay, got it, thank you. Uh, let's move right. on. Uh, thank you again, and let's move on to the... Welcome. To the Hello to everyone. Uh, please unshare the, the screen. Um, okay, so the next talk uh, is uh, will be given by Matteo Santilli, I think. Yes, Matteo is there. So the title is Secure Rendezvous and Containment in Multi-Robot Systems. So please, Matteo, go ahead. Thank you for the introduction. Um, okay, you should see the screen. Okay. So good morning, everyone. I'm Matteo Santilli from Roma Drei University. And today um, we're going to talk about the worst that me, uh, Professor Mauro Franceschelli and Professor Andrea Gaspari have been doing on secure control problems in multi-robot system. As many of you may know, uh, multi-robot system gained a lot in, of interest in the last decades, both in the academic and industrial environments. Uh, one of the reasons for their popularity is the fact that a multi-robot system can easily, be, uh, can easily fulfill uh, tasks that are usually assigned to humans, and especially the dangerous ones like uh, uh, exploration of caves or uh, uh, search and rescue operation in hostile environments. One of the aspects to consider though when uh, developing a multi-robot system is their, rob is their robustness to failures and even cyber physical attacks. While it is generally true that uh, there is strength in numbers, it is also true, unfortunately, that even a single non-cooperative agent can disrupt the emerging behavior of the network, either if it's actually trying to disrupt the systems, is meaning that it's a physical attack run, or a cyber physical attack, or if it just suffered a fault, so it is not willingly attacking, but is just uh, damaged. For this reason, in the last five, 10 years, a lot of literature has been dealing with the secure and resilient control problems. And in this field, uh, the works of LeBlanc, Zhang, and Sundaram are especially relevant because they developed a, a graph theoretical condition, a topology con condition, that is able to ensure robustness against uh, the presence of a, a certain thin number of uh, uh, malicious attackers, adversarial agents in the, in the network. And they started also a trend in which many works are the state of the art between uh, like uh, the work from Franceschelli, Giù and Pisano and also uh, the first work that we um, uh, did in this line of research uh, that, the, that consists in uh, characterizing uh, the graph theoretical uh, properties in order to ensure robustness. And uh, the worst, uh, our contribution to this, uh, to this field is so far composed of, of the three manuscripts that are here provided. We submitted, we started like a work uh, with a CDC that has been published last year, where we consider the uh, robust containment control problems. On the problem, we actually uh, consist in designing a distributed control law in order to uh, contain a certain group of agents of robots that we denote as followers in an area that is delimited by the position of another set of agents that we call as leaders. We then extended uh, this result in a, um, in a manuscript that's been submitted to the transactional robotics and just last week has been conditionally accepted where we adopted uh, the actual the, the, um, the topology properties that have been 
uh, developed by Zhang and Sundaram. They are known as RS robustness that we will see later. And then we also uh, prepare another work that we submitted to Automatica in which we consider also uh, other than the contain and control problem, even the, the, the problem of the rendezvous. Um, okay, so today's talk is gonna be about the, um, I'm gonna talk about this tour journal and we'll first discuss about the, the dynamic resilient contain and contain and control problem. Uh, dynamic resilient contain and control multi row system. The manuscript that just got that set, conditionally accepted on the T-Row. So the modeling of the robots is the following. Uh, we consider that in the network, there are actually three sets of robots, the followers, the leaders, and the adversarial agents. They evolve according to uh, a single integrated law in a continuous time system and evolve in a d-dimensional space. And we assume also that the speed of the leaders is actually upper bounded by a positive scalar UL max. The network topology is actually uh, uh, described by an indirected time varying graph with nodes at D and at set E. And we denote the networks uh, of the agent I as NI. And uh, in this case, the edges represent the sensing of presence within robots, meaning that uh, an, uh, each robot knows if a neighbor is in front or in the back with respect to a common bearing direction. And in fact, we assume in this work that we have uh, we, they, the robots share D minus one common bearing direction. And from this example, in the two dimensional case, we can assume, for example, that we have the, the knowledge of the, the magnetic north. Um, in this case, in this work, what we, we do consider we want to solve is the containment control problem that, as I said earlier, consists in uh, containing the followers that are here represented with the red shadows, the drones with the red shadows that are actually flying over the Puerto Beach. And we want to contain them in this area, this upper rectangle that is defined by the positions of these other green uh, drones that are actually the leaders. And the control law that we use to uh, actually solve this problem is the following, presented in one, which is actually not a novel because it has been uh, vastly used in the literature for the consensus problem. So here, uh, and by the way, this uh, control law can be implemented in a local way just with the assumption that we have so with a common bearing directions and the uh, measurement of presence, the sensing of presence. And so here, in this case, our contribution is actually to characterize the uh, graph theoretical uh, condition, the, the topology properties of our network in order to uh, allow a certain numbers in the network, uh, a certain numbers of adversarial agents in the network and still able to uh, achieve the desired objective. And the topological condition that we actually use, as I, as I mentioned earlier, is the RS robustness that's being introduced by Zhang and Sandaram. To, to define it, let us first define, uh, introduce the definition of our reachable set, which is the following. Uh, we say that a subset S of a graph G is R reachable if there exists an agent, a node inside that subset, such that uh, he has uh, at least R neighbors without considering the other nodes in the subset S. So let's say, let's consider the set S1, there are the, the red nodes one and two. The set is, this set is too reachable because if, we can, if, if there is at least one agent, in this case, for example, agent one, there are two neighbors without considering uh, the other member of the subset S. If we consider, for example, the S2, this is composed of four and six, this set is three reachable because without considering each other, there is at least one agent that has three, uh, that has three neighbors. So like, for example, six has five, three, and one without considering four. And the definition actually of the R of, R of RS robust graph is that if uh, for each pairs of this joint subset, S1 and S2, either the subsets are one of the two is R reachable, or together they have at least S nodes that are, have possess R neighbors outside of them. And in this case, the graph that we were uh, just checking is two to robust. With this in mind, uh, we are able we were able to prove. Uh, the, the main results of our, uh, of our uh, manuscript, our work, that is the following. We are actually able to uh, ensure the finite time convergence to the uh, uh, hybrid rectangle described by the position of the leaders, uh, despite uh, uh, the influence of the adversarial agents, 
that by the way, uh, we consider anonymous, so they cannot be recognized. We assume they, uh, that they um, possess full knowledge of the network and full knowledge of the states of the agents. And also uh, they are uh, embedded with an unbounded control input. So we are considering the worst case scenario. And this modeling actually consider both the fact that an agent is actually trying to attack the system and even if uh, an agent is actually just faulty, uh, it still can be modeled by this, uh, by this problem formulation. And so the condition on the graph is actually the following. We, we want to have a graph, this uh, RS robust for all time instance, and where the headset can change only during instance of time of mesut zero. And then the condition is the following. We want the actual, the gain of the agents to be greater than the speed of the leaders in order to be able to track them. And we want the level to, of the robustness of the graph to be greater than the numbers or at least abound on the numbers of the adversarial agent. And then we have this condition on the actual number of edges that connects the, um, the followers and the adversary. And we are able to prove this result resulting to non smooth analysis tool. And uh, also we are able to get an upper bound of on the gorge benchers time at the end. And I prepared this so, uh, oh, should be a video. Uh, oh, oh, sorry. Uh, just a second. Uh, I was not expecting this. Uh, that's okay though, because we are here. Uh, 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 sorry, sorry for this. Uh, oh, I'm really sorry. Um, okay, where we see that the uh, red followers are entering the containment area that is defined by the position of the leaders. There are the green ones. And even if the adversarial agents are depicted with the blue triangle and the, um, yeah, the, the adversarial agents that are depicted with the blue triangle are moving and the leaders as well are moving, the followers are still able to remain contained the, in the hyper rectangle that is defined by the position of the leaders. Okay, go back to the, to the actual slides. And uh, okay, one limitation though of this work is that we assume the presence of a common reference frame, common bearing direction actually. And in fact, many uh, works at the state of the art in order to achieve multidimensional containment, even rendezvous, and the case of a uh, uh, secure problem, so with the presence of uh, adversarial agents in the network, uh, require those, uh, those kind of assumptions. So require or either a common reference frame or access to absolute solution. And we wanted to uh, remove such assumption and develop a new strategy that is able without, uh, without, them, without them to achieve the, both the secure rendezvous and the containment. And based on this new methodology that we've developed, we prepare another smart script that has been now submitted to Automatica. Basically, the idea of, the, of this other work is first to build a secure area for the followers that is unaffected by the presence of the adversarial agents. And then we let the, move, the followers move inside of it. And the, uh, we call this area as VA secure convex hole, and is actually built in the following way. We intersect convex hole of states of neighbors and the agent I, where each time where we, we removed from consideration the states of a certain subset of neighbors, where the, where the sets I has a certain cardinality that usually is uh, equal to uh, the number of the bound on the number of adversarial agents since the neighbor is expected to be greater. And to let you uh, understand better what, uh, what this law is actually, this area, how it's built, this area, I prepared a small example here. That is the following. Let's assume we are the agent one and we want to build our secure area. These are all our neighbors. And we don't know that actually agent three is a, a malicious one, as, as, a malicious, as an adversarial agent. So as first thing, we remove from consideration agent two and we obtain this convex hole. Then we will move on and remove agent three from consideration. And uh, we obtain that the intersection is actually this area, this lighting in CM. Then we go on and remove agent four and we obtain that the area is like uh, is smaller. And then we go on, we remove five, we remove six, and we remove even seven and eight, but in this case, it doesn't change because they're in the interior of the general convex hole, so the area stays the same. 
And this area, actually, we managed to prove that is always contained in the convex soul of uh, good agents, so let's say like that, so followers and leaders if present. And it's thus uh, unaffected by the, the adversarial agent. And with this in mind, um, actually, our work is uh, as a, a bit different modeling from the previous one. And that in particular, in this case, we consider a discrete time system where the leaders are static. And uh, this time the graph is directed and we have the possibility to sense relative distance. So there is, no, I mean, there is not anymore the assumption on the uh, common varying directions and the sensing of presence. And we let each robot move toward the centroid of the secure convex hole, meaning the geometry mean of all points. And with this in mind, we ask again ourselves, which are the uh, graph topological conditions that are able to ensure robustness in this kind of, uh, in this kind of context. And they actually, they, we obtained two results, one for the rendezvous, we are able to group both rendezvous and uh, static containment. And the, con the graph theoretical condition in this case is that the graph has to be uh, VA D plus one plus one robust for all time instance, where D, as I said earlier, is the dimensional of the space. And again, uh, I stress the fact that uh, we consider the worst case scenario for the adversarial agents. And we are actually able in this case to prove the uh, asymptotic convergence to the random point P uh, that is of the followers. For the steady containment, instead the uh, condition, the graph topological condition that we require is actually stronger. <laughs> uh, it, it is actually the strongly, the same VAD plus one plus one robustness, which is the difference is actually uh, the fact that before in the RS robustness, we require for each couple of subset, the certain condition to meet. Uh, to be satisfied. In this case, we regard for each subset, not for each uh, pairs. And again, here we're able to prove the asymptotic conversions of the followers to the convex soul of the initial position of the leader. So in this case, we're also able to improve the area of containment. But before we had an hyper rectangle, in this case, we have the convex soul of the initial position of the leaders. And even here, uh, yeah, we managed to prove the results with uh, I'll actually resort to a lexicographical order function that is composed to, uh, of the volume B of the convex solo followers or followers and leader combined in the containment case. And the function C that is the number of robots that are at the border of the convex all. And meaning that we manage to prove that each iteration, either the volume is of the convex solo is decreasing or either that if the convex solo does not decrease in size, the number of agents that are at the border is actually decreasing. So the robots that are at the border actually going towards the inside. So eventually this will lead to the degrees of the, of the convex hole until uh, we reach the, the rendezvous point or the, uh, or the containment. And I prepared here, okay, I was expecting this this time, another video to show quickly, okay where we have the followers that are depicted with the red circles that are actually entering the container in the containment area and the convex soul of the leaders. This is an evolution over time of the two-dimensional uh, multi-robot system and they're able to remain contained in the area despite the doing the behavior of the adversarial agents. Okay. And so, yeah, that's it. What we explained today, what we have been doing on this line of research, and so far we addressed the secure rendezvous and the containment control problem. And we actually characterize some graph theoretical condition in order to be able to ensure robustness for our objective. And for the worst, we'll, be, uh, fo we'll focus on uh, developing distributed strategy, again, for secure coordination. But we want to explore the possibility of secure optimization and consider multi-robot system with Iger dynamics. That is all. Uh, thank you. Uh, if you have uh, any question. Okay, so thank you so much uh, for the presentation, Matteo. Uh, very nice talk. Um, so is there any question for, uh, for Matteo? And as usual, please write it down in the chat if, if you have a question. So in the meantime, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. So are you, uh, actually a couple of questions. Uh, one of them, I noticed that in both videos, uh, mm -hmm. agents basically reach rendezvous. 
Whereas when you have containment, they yeah. can also see. Actually, mm -hmm. yeah. So actually, I'm wondering if it's due to the fact that the follower graph is very connected uh, due to the conditions that we impose. Yeah, there may be because actually this was just uh, I can check, take again the the first actually uh, because we had also other um, in other simulation like it does. It's not say that it's not guaranteed to actually achieve a rendezvous. So yeah, it's probably because the 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 graph is really connected, and that's why the the followers are also able to achieve the rendezvous. But it's not guaranteed in the, in the case of the containment. No, actually, you would like not to not to have necessarily. So in general, you just want the agents to be around in the convex cell. Right? Exactly. Uh, and I was wondering if you are have in mind to consider bounds on the inputs, because if I understand you allow any any input, right? For the for the adversarial for the adversarial uh, robots, yeah, uh, yes, just for them because we are considering the the worst case scenario. Uh, actually, then in the in the case for the um, the followers are actually running this controller in this case, and the leaders are actually upper bounded by a uh, by a speed. In the case okay. of the okay. so you have the bound, yes. Yeah, okay. Yes. No, because I, I I did not see it in the theorem, so I, I thought you didn't have a bound. Okay. No, 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 it was yeah. Okay, so is there any other question for uh, Matteo? Okay, so if not, thank you again, and let's move to the next speaker. Thank you. Okay, so the next speaker is uh, Giuseppe Silano, right? Yes. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, yeah, so the title of the talk is a framework uh, for power line inspection tasks uh, with uh, multi robot systems uh, from signal temporal logic specifications. Yes. So let please. me start from the beginning. Okay, so can I start? Yes, please. Okay, so good morning to everyone. I'm Giuseppe Silano, a postdoc researcher at Czech Technical University in Prague, and today I'm going to present uh, this uh, work entitled A Framework for Power Line Inspection Task with Multi Robot System from Signal Temporal Logic Specification. This is a joint work between the Czech, Czech Technical University in Prague, the NEA Fusion and Nuclear Safety Department, and the University of Sanyo. This work is founded by two European projects, Real Core and Comfort Drones. So let me start from the uh, motivation behind this work. Electrical company uh, invest a lot of, of effort on the inspection and the maintenance of power line infrastructure, looking for possible mechanical uh, failure. The most common strategy is to perform this inspection at regular intervals. Uh, this means with, uh, as we can see on the right, with manned helicopters that are equipped with uh, thermal and RGB cameras or with uh, uh, probes, uh, as we can see in uh, this uh, in this photo. This process is very time consuming and expensive, but dangerous also for the human operators, because as you can see here, these operators is very close to the power line with the probe in order to measure possible failure that are, let's say, um, are close to the to the line. So it's of interest to understand if advanced control techniques can be used to reduce the cost of keeping the human operator safe. One of the key directions to tackle this problem is to use a manager aircraft uh, uh, vehicles. And uh, uh, this can perform two types of inspection, uh, micro and micro level inspection. Uh, a micro level inspection can be performed with the fixed wind aircraft. Uh, even if they cannot over itself, they can be used to, um, to inspect a large area. Uh, uh, instead, the rotary wing vehicle can be used to perform a micro level inspection very close to the power lines. So looking for possible uh, failure that uh, or damage of the conductors. Uh, three are the mainly uh, approach the able in the literature. Uh, computer vision approach, cooperative path planning uh, approaches, and motion planning. The first one, uh, the computer vision, you know, it's related to the use of computer vision algorithms in order to identify possible, uh, possible damage of, uh, for example, uh, the line, uh, the insulator, and so on. The cooperative path planning uh, instead uh, use multi-robot system in order to cover an area minimizing a cost function that can be the path, that can be the time. And the last one that is the one that uh, it's related to the work that I'm presenting is the motion planning algorithm where a multi-robot multi system, sorry, 
uh, has to uh, perform the inspection, avoiding obstacles and possible collision with the, the environment. The challenge is related to the, um, the constraints that characterize a managerial vehicles, like the battery capacity of uh, a managerial vehicle can fly for 15, 20 minutes, no more. Also, the strong electromagnetic field that uh, are, uh, are generated by the power line that can disturb the compass of the drone, and also the presence of obstacles like branches, marker bolts. So, this problem is particularly difficult, and having a UAV capable of interpreting high level the possible big uh, task specification and also plan to execute appropriate action, uh, it's more and more important. Uh, temporal logic and so symbolic control uh, can be used to achieve this task. In particular, singular temporal logic provides a very high level formal language can describe a plan, uh, planning objectives more complex than will suit the point-to-point -point navigation algorithms, like, for example, the star, a star, R key, and, uh, and so on. So we propose a framework to encode uh, missions for uh, a fleet of quadrotors using motion primitives for the trajectory generation. This means that starting from a natural uh, description of the problem, uh, we um, we synthesize STL specification, then we move to an high level controller that construct the optimization problem. This problem is solved at once. And once we have the trajectory, sorry, once we have the trajectory for uh, the uh, end drones, we are able to send these trajectories to the end quadrotors where a low level controller tackle the trajectory tracking problem. Here, the trajectory is uh, represented with R and with Psi that represent the special coordinate X, Y, and Z in the uh, word frame and the heading angle. So let's uh, consider the dynamical system and in particular a discretized version that here is represented with X uh, to uh, plus, where X represents the current state. Instead, X plus represents the uh, next state. U is the control input. Uh, T S is the sampling period and T is the trajectory duration. So we can split the time as, um, as, as we can see here, zero TS, two TS and so on where n times ts is the period and tk represents a general element of the vector. So in this way, given an initial state x, x con zero and uh, a finite control sequence u, we can obtain a trajectory of the system as the unique sequence of the state x, uh, x con zero, x con one, up to uh, x con n. In this way, the trajectory generator is designed to, sit, uh, to, uh, to satisfy a specification expressed in STL logic. But what is a STL? An STL is a logic that allows a description, a very high level task like this one. For example, the quadrotor has to reach in 10 time units uh, in uh, a region avoiding uh, obstacle along the path. Or for example, uh, while the quadrotor is in the first zone, it must abide to the zone altitude constraints in a mathematical way. So a logic can be constructed by using this grammar where T represents the Boolean logical true, P is the predicate, this means the negation, also uh, the end operators between two uh, logical formulas, and then these uh, U, square, and diamond are temporal operator that allows, for example, to codify these always in a, a, in a, um, in a specification. Uh, designing a controller that satisfy uh, an STL formula is not always possible due to unforeseen events that uh, might come from the environment. For this reason, it is useful to introduce a robust semantic, a robust semantic of an STL formula in general of a temporal logic formula. It it's, uh, um, give us the possibility uh, to say uh, the bound in which the, uh, the formula is uh, satisfied as we can see here, so let's introduce a row of phi, um, the, which data belongs uh, to x and the time. So if this value is less than zero, so this means that the state uh, violates the formula at the time tk, uh, uh, whether if the row phi is greater than zero, 
uh, it satisfies this formula. So, and in the case it's equal to zero, this is inconclusive. This comes from the paper that is reported below. So we can construct an optimization problem maximizing the robustness over of this, uh, uh, this robust semantic. Of course, the larger is the robust uh, and the more is the robust behavior of the system. So the goal is to find a probably correct control scheme for a robot system. Uh, by defining this optimization problem where uh, epsilon is greater than zero and represents the desired minimum robustness and uh, the subject to the state, uh, as we can see here, the control input and uh, the, um, yes, the state at the, the next state and the, the current state. This, solve, this problem can be generally solved by using mixed integral programming solver. However, it's convenient to approximate this non-differential objective uh, uh, function that here is represented as rho of, uh, rho of pi and uh, solve this, uh, this approximation by using a sequential quadratic programming method as it described in this recent uh, research uh, paper. But to come up with a trajectory that satisfy vehicle constraints like, for example, the maximum velocity and the maximum acceleration that characterize a physical uh, UAV, we can use motion primitives. Uh, and we started from the one defined in this paper, this transactional robotics a few years ago. As you can see, uh, these motion primitives are powerful because uh, thanks to the uh, parameters alpha, beta, gamma, we can set the behavior of the system. This means that we can say if the, if the vehicle uh, or the set of vehicles has to reach the waypoint, so uh, with the zero velocity or the acceleration or with a given velocity or a given acceleration, including these motion primitives in the optimization problem that I show uh, you below, uh, before, sorry, uh, we can uh, we can obtain trajectory uh, for uh, uh, the power line inspection task. So the high level controller, as I said to you at the beginning, is implemented one shot, and the optimization problem is solved at once, and then the trajectory are used to. Um, for the trading inspection uh, problem. This is uh, a numerical example that we use uh, just to prove the validity and the effectiveness of the proposed approach. Let me explain you the example and then I will go inside the, these formulas. Two drones have to expect a quarter of the power tower. A quarter of the power tower just for sake of simplicity because as you can imagine, this is a very uh, NPR problem that can explode with the number of variables or with the number of constraints also. Uh, these uh, uh, drones not only has to avoid possible collision uh, so with the power tower and also maintaining a safe distance among uh, each other. So thanks to this formula, we can codify this, I mean the distance among each other. As you can see here, the square, it's over the, um, the time interval, zero t. And then uh, thanks to this norm, we can assign to this delta minimum, the minimum distance that the drone should keep during the inspection. Then, thanks to this formula, we can ensure that the drone has to respect this distance and also has to work in the workspace. And then half of the drone has to inspect first the first, let's say, insulator pole, and then the third one. And the other half of the drone has to inspect first the second pole, and then the third one. In the end, they have to come back to the um, to the uh, initial position uh, and in order to track the trajectory that are obtained uh, by this optimization problem we use the, the uh, control algorithm that is presented in this paper so let me show you this paper i hope that i can switch from the presentation to the video it should be possible let me see uh, yes 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 Okay, so first of all, I don't know uh, if you can see, I will try to, uh, let's say, move to full screen mode. So as you can see here, this is a MATLAB simulation where I will explain you why it's running. The two drones for that uh, I will use it as a uh, numerical example, uh, start from this uh, magenta, this purple uh, position, then as to expect first the blue region and then the green one. When they reach the target point in uh, these uh, boxes uh, represent the accuracy because uh, um, the optimization problem is not constrained to reach a, a given, uh, let's say, point, but a region in the area. 
They stay there for a while, simulating a possible data acquisition process, and then move to the other one. The red boxes here represent the, um, the obstacles, so lines, uh, and uh, these are the targeted isolator. In this simulation, in MATLAB Simulink, we do not consider the drone dynamics and the um, low-level controller. As you can see at the end of the simulation, the drone come back to the initial position. So in order to understand if the, uh, the trajectory that we obtained from the optimization problem makes sense, we, uh, we performed a simulation in Gazebo, as we can see here. In this case, we are considering the drone dynamics and also the low-level control uh, algorithm. Here represented the image that are captured by the two cameras that are um, on the drone. And as you can see, the drone not only are able to inspect the power line because they reach the target and from the camera you can see the isolator, but also avoid the collision with the cable at the power tower itself and keep a distance uh, between each other. So as before, um, the drones perform the, uh, the inspection and then come back to the initial position. Just a few seconds for the end of the simulation. Let me come back to the presentation, just a few minutes. Okay. So conclusion and future words about this problem. We presented the method for generating a trajectory for a 3D quad rotors for power tower inspection star, uh, tasks, starting from a signal temporal logic specification. We performed a simulation in MATLAB simulating by using the robotics simulator Gazebo, and we show in this way, uh, by numerical simulation, let's say in this way, the validity and the effectiveness of the proposed approach. As future work, we could, uh, sorry, uh, we are planning to run a real world experiment in order to understand if, uh, let's say, the simulation result in some way match with the physical world. And also, we, actually, we would like to extend this world running the optimization problem partially online. That is mean that we would like to, um, to simulate possible dynamic obstacles that at a certain point appear in the scenario and the drone should be able to avoid this obstacle. As I told you at the beginning, this work is partially funded by the two European project Con for Drones and the Aerial Core. And that's it for my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Okay, so thank you, Giuseppe, for uh, for your talk. And uh, it's the last talk. But if you have questions, please, uh, as usual, ask in the in the chat window. Let me ask you a question in the meantime. So, uh, when you consider the dynamics of the quadrotors. In the last uh, simulation, could it happen that uh, in uh, uh, controlling the, the true dynamics, uh, you run into risk of uh, uh, not satisfying the constraints in the optimization problem? So uh, it could happen. It could happen, but the controller that we use it in some way allows that uh, um, we um, cl uh, it's able to track the trajectory in the way that uh, is so close to the ELD solution. So we didn't find a problem on this, but of course it could happen. It depends on the control architecture. Okay. So if there are no other questions, uh, let me thank again Giuseppe and all thank the speakers and all of you attending the, the session and um, have a good uh, day and uh, conference, virtual conference.